Thank you so much and great job to David and, uh, and the F50 gang for uh, pulling this all together. Somewhere around here, I assume there's a clicker. Is there a clicker somewhere around here? There must be a clicker somewhere. Oh. So, um, here it is. So, all right, drive or something. Here we go. So, now for some, uh, and now for some people to come So, we've had, um, for most of the day today, we've been hearing from the front lines, some people in the trenches, you know, the nitty gritty of what's going on here in the innovation ecosystem and in the entrepreneurship world. So I decided I'd take kind of a step back and look from a larger angle at the future of innovation, talk a little bit about how innovation has changed during our collective careers and how there have now become new rules for how you do that for, for being successful in the current innovation environment. So I started my career as an entrepreneur here in Stanford. As a graduate student, I started a software company long ago and far away before it was fashionable for graduate students to start software companies. But um, that company was spectacularly unsuccessful and crashed and burned. But I then uh, went on to do three more companies, two of which went public. Um, another one crashed and burned. But, uh, so I started out as a serial entrepreneur and then switched to becoming a venture capitalist. Um, starting co-founding Raj Technology Ventures with Guy Kawasaki and a bunch of other folks. Uh, and so I've spent a chunk of my career, I'd like to say I have done some innovation. I've certainly invested in innovation, so I've thought a lot about innovation. And what I've discovered is that, in fact, the nature of innovation has changed during our careers. So to discuss that, let's do a brief history of innovation. So most of the history of mankind was era Innovation 1.0. Innovation 1.0 was the first 5,000 years of human history. You know, we invented the wheel, we invented the lever, we built the wall, we built the pyramids, we did all sorts of great things, right? So fast forward to Innovation 2.0 in, in the 18th and 19th century, we discovered steam engine, steam power, we discovered electricity, electric power, and there was a huge, surge of innovation and invention, which became the Industrial Revolution. It was characterized by guys like this, you know, sort of brilliant inventors like Thomas Edison, who gets credit for inventing the light bulb, although we all know he didn't really invent the light bulb. So, fast forward to the 20th century, 20th century innovation 3.0 became the era of corporate innovation. So in Technology got more complicated, got more expensive, it got harder, and so corporations set up R&D ladders. And so we restructured our innovation ecosystem so that big corporations like, you know, AT&T, in this case RCA, and then IBM, these companies set up these big innovation labs. This is, this is David Sarnoff, who gets credit for inventing the television at RCA. Subsequently, founder of Sarnoff Labs, which created all sorts of brilliant innovations. Fast forward to World War II. After World War II, we had Innovation 4.0. Dramatic shift in, in innovation, <laughs> which lasted roughly from 1945 to 2008. During this period in the post-war era, we had the most dramatic global growth that we have seen in the history of the world. And during this period, all of these technologies were invented. So we invented the jet engine, we invented atomic energy, we invented microprocessors, we invented the Green Revolution, container ships, we invented venture capital, one of the more interesting inventions in the post-war era. It was an unbelievably prolific era of human invention, which led to the greatest era of economic growth in the history of the world during this 60-year you know, period. But what drove, what drove Innovation 4.0? Well, a lot of the drivers were other things. So demographics, so the population of the world changed from about two and a half billion people to about six and a half billion people during this period. We had the Cold War, which drove big government into innovation. So massive government invest, investments in technology. And so we, had, we also had incredible global education. The literacy of the world was transformed from 1945 to 2008. And of course, globalization of trade and economics, the entry of China into the global capitalist system, the end of the Cold War, which is another spur of growth, and then also technology. 
So you think about this post-war era that most of us grew up in, and you realize we're not going to see it again. We've tapped out so much of what drove global growth during the post-war era. So now we're in Innovation 5.0. Innovation 5.0 started roughly in 2008. Two big things happened in 2008. So what were the two big things that happened in 2008? Right, the meltdown, right? We almost lost, we almost lost the global capitalist system. We almost lost the global financial system. It was an unbelievable event for, you know, for, for those of us who lived through it. But what was the other big thing that happened in 2008? Yeah, yeah, pretty good, right. The iPhone goes global. The iPhone goes, goes global. Now usually at this point somebody pipes up, it used to be that somebody would pipe up and say, Bill, Bill, Bitcoin, Bitcoin happened in 2008. <laughs> Nobody pipes up <laughs> So, in any case, you were piping it up? Okay. So, in any case, the world is dramatically different now. How is it different? Well, so now we're entering a new age of innovation, and I would submit to you that the rules of innovation have now changed. So we've developed what we call the top 10 rules for investors and entrepreneurs in the new age of innovation 5.0. Given my time, however, I hope we get to two or three. <laughs> so rule number one, rule number one has to do with the diff difference between invention and innovation. And this is kind of an interesting observation that in, in innovation is very different than invention. If you look at all of these technologies that were invented in the post-war era, you know, you look at all this and you say, boy, how many of them came out of Silicon Valley? Silicon Valley, the center of innovation and technology in the post-war era. What technologies came out of Silicon Valley? Very few. Maybe, you know, we get some credit for the microprocessor, right? We don't even get credit for venture capital. We don't even get credit for venture capital. And you think about what's going on here in Silicon Valley. Think of all the successful companies in Silicon Valley. Can anyone name a company in Silicon Valley that was founded on a technology it invented? I can only think of two. Facebook did not invent social networking. Google did not invent search. Apple did not invent anything. Right? <laughs> Oracle did not invent relational databases. Name a big company that built its company on the, its own technology. Cisco is one. Thank you. And the other one is? HP. Not HP. What did HP invent? The oscilloscope? No. <laughs> Intel. Intel. Yeah. Intel you know, invented the processor, right? <laughs> but think of all the other companies, all the you know, huge companies in Silicon Valley. They did not invent their technologies. They stole other people's technologies. Well, they borrowed. They you know, innovated on top of it. And then created great companies. So the key, the key is not invention. In the post-war era, we thought it was all about invention, intellectual property, universities, research. In the new era, it's about innovation. Of course, we still need invention. But, you know, the key is innovation. The key to innovation is execution. So the next rule, rule number two, is it's not about building a balanced team. It's about building an unbalanced team. How do you execute? How do you out-execute everyone else? You can't out-execute simply by hiring talent across different sectors. You've got to hire something more than just skill sets. You've got to hire mindsets as well. And I try to explain this in the form of a parable. It's the parable of the optimist, the pessimist, and the engineer. And you've heard some of this before, right? It goes something like this. The optimist looks at the glass and says, hey, this glass is half full. And the pessimist looks at the glass and says, nah, that glass is half empty. And the engineer looks at the same glass and says, this glass was engineered to be twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> so the point of the story, the point of the story is same set of facts, but three different perspectives. And so that's the key to execution. It's not good enough to have skill sets. You've got to have mindsets. You've got to have a diversity of perspective on your team. 
You obviously need the optimist. You obviously, well, you don't obviously need the pessimist, but you need somebody who's going to keep things going when you don't hit all those goals that you set in your plan. But you need this third perspective as well. You need a person who sees the world for the way the world truly is. That's the hardest mindset to get into a startup company. But you need all three different perspectives. So with that, my time is up. So I got two out of 10. So, you know, the next thing, <laughs> so wait for my book. The book will be coming out <laughs> early and often. So with that, I will turn the mic back over. Thank you very much.